And welcome back to the Cover 3 podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Danny Cannell. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson. A uh, lot to get to today, including the definitive list from which we will find our national champion. Much more on that in a minute. Plus, we've got continued fallout from the college football playoff announcement, the 12-team model, uh, a little bit of ownership and some accountability being taken by some of the rights holders around the conversation of college football, which when we talk about the sport and the health of it, that is certainly a part of it. Plus, um, you know, we've got some reporting on the ways that the conference commissioners and college football stakeholders are thinking about changing conferences so if we do away with division play what would that mean uh for the way that we talk about some jobs the way that we talk about some programs where we talk about some conferences so we'll get into all of that but uh back to that list the definitive list of the teams that are have what they need to win the national championship and that is talent now if you've been following bud elliott for a long time then you know about the blue chip ratio. And we referenced it on Monday's show, but we thought that since we've got uh, the author of the theory here as a host of the show, that we should uh, give it some good time for listeners who are not initiated or not familiar with it. Because Bud, uh, as I mentioned before we started recording, I've used it as sort of an an annual baseline on my season prep doc, you know, just to like get that. I want to get those teams in my mind. I, I want to have uh, that talent um, comp- that talent aspect of my analysis ready to go. So for those who have no idea, I, I don't want to step on any, um, any ways that you want to explain it. For those that have no idea, what is the blue chip ratio? Uh, and how do you, where do you draw the line? And, and how do you determine that list? This year it is 16. We'll get to the number of teams in a little bit, but uh, 16 teams that have the talent necessary to win the national championship. Sure. So the blue chip ratio is something I came up with, I think in like 2011, uh, I, I've been covering recruiting for a couple of years. I've been at all these camps and, you know, back in the day, we, we heard a lot about, you know, can Wisconsin win the national championship? Can Michigan state, can TCU, can Baylor, can, I don't know, there, there were a couple other teams at the time who, who were getting some love. And just from, from coming off the, the summer of those camps, I was like, man, I, I see the kind of guys that like an Alabama or an Ohio state sign. They're just a much better quality of athlete that, than the, the player that those schools sign. And it's not that they never end up having good players, but I'm like, those guys are not going to beat one of these better teams for the national title. It just ain't going to happen because of the quality of player that you recruit, especially when you stack those classes. So what I did is I went back and and I looked at what the minimum level of recruiting was over the prior four classes uh, to win a national title. And I really lucked into something, guys. I found that the minimum percentage of blue chips you had to have, so four and five stars, as opposed to two and three stars, was half. So like, oh, this is great. Like anytime you're in, you're in media and you can come up with a nice, just round number. 50. So you got it. I was like, oh, I got something here. We're, we're, we're cooking with gas. So I, I put it out and, and I realized like, this is, this is something that people are, are latching onto. Cause it is really, it's not saying that they have what it takes to win the national title. It's just the absolute bare minimum that you need to do over a four year period to have like the minimum level of recruiting that you would need to win the national title. There are teams on this list that in this given year, I don't really believe can do it. But I know that on the recruiting side of things, they've at least signed the minimum level of athleticism and physical talent that you would need to win it. So that's basically what it is. And it's been perfect every year since. So uh, Mariota almost got me. And Deshaun Watson, uh, the first time that Nick Saban onside kick, they were like 49%, I think it was that year. And they had Deshaun Watson. He almost clipped me. I know this won't be perfect forever, probably, but. It's been damn good for a decade. And Clemson the next year is one of the low title winners at 56. I'm pulling that off the top of my head. I, don't know I if believe they were like 52. FSU with with, uh, with Jameis was 53 because it still had that 2010 class baked into there. Um, that, that's the thing. This year we have an all-time high uh, with Alabama at 84%. And <laughs> stupid. If you take out kickers and punters who basically don't get rated four and five stars, Bama would be over 90%. So, which granted, everybody would go up if you took out kickers and punters, but literally, I mean, they're, I think they've only signed 16 guys in the last four years who were not four or five stars and about <laughs> half of those are kickers and punters. So you think about how damn good you got to be to be a three-star who actually gets an offer from Alabama and stays a three-star. Um, but yeah, we do see teams that are in the fifties and sixties still winning this LSU a couple of years ago was at like 63, I think. Uh, so it, 
you just you need to get over this minimum talent threshold. I have a real hard time seeing teams that are not over this threshold winning a title. Do you think the threshold's going to change though because of the twelve team? Because and I, I think it'll, I, I mean, will it increase? Because we talked about this a little on Twitter yesterday. I think part of the playoff is the expansion is going to make it more difficult for most teams. It'll give them greater access. But now once you get there, you're being asked to win at least three games against other elite teams. So if we're looking at the ratio and how it works right now, where it's like you need half your roster to be blue chip players in order to beat three other three of those teams. Are we going to see it where that's going to increase to like 55, 60 percent, where it's like you're going to have to have an even higher ratio of blue chip players to win those three games? Tom, I, I think I agree with you on that. Uh, I, I wrote a couple of years ago when we went to four that I thought, uh, you know, this would increase the, the opportunities for teams to beat it, but I think it actually is potentially tougher. It's almost like if you ever been a bookie and you see those, those parlay bets coming in for, mm -hmm. from your clients, uh, in theory, uh, you know, like the, the more teams... That, <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> the, 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 more, the more legs they put in that parlay, the happier you get. Because it's just, it, you know, trying to win three games against, against those teams that have better talent than you it's just unlikely somebody's going to clip you. Now, the beauty of the 12 teamer is that fans are still going to believe in their team. If they've had a magical enough season to make it, especially if they're one of these teams that doesn't recruit on this super level, they're going to believe in their team. They're, they're going to root for them, even though we kind of know they're not going to win at all. So it's Santa Claus. That's what the new playoff is. Basically. Yeah. It's so weird. the model, so how far have you modeled back to see this? The college football playoff era, 14 playoff? Uh, towards like the end of the BCS, basically okay. uh, the, the the data is limited once you get like into the 90s because there weren't a whole lot of ranking services. The number of players who were rated uh, was different, and um, some of the composite scores for back in the day are are off because of how some of the websites were scraped. I think, uh, for instance, I had to manually go back and do 2010 Auburn uh, because like Jonathan Mency who was a good, good corner on that team. I think he played in the league. Uh, we know he was a four-star player out of Georgia, right? But in the composite, he shows up as a zero star. But if you go back to the scout.com days, which 24-7 sports acquired, you, I, on the back end, I can actually see what his grade was, and he, he had a four-star grade. So uh, I, I had to manually go back and check some of those individual teams back, back in the day. Uh, but – it's really only gotten stronger of late. And I think that's because the better teams do seem to be signing a little bit higher percentage of, of the overall talent. For instance, I believe four of our five highest teams ever have occurred this year or last year. Right. That's, I was going to ask about two things uh, in terms of the split. And so I'm going to lay out the, the list real quick. Uh, Alabama is at the top at 84%, Georgia at 80, Ohio State at 79 drop a tier next is Clemson at 67 then four teams all at 66 percent LSU Oklahoma Texas Florida then we drop a tier Texas A&M at 61 Michigan at 58 you got Auburn Oregon Penn State at 56 starting to get real jumbled up Notre Dame and Miami at 55 percent USC at 53 now the teams that are on the cut line correct me if I'm wrong Washington's right on the cut line but they are below it Tennessee is at 48 Florida State is about two classes away, and you said North Carolina is probably two classes away at 35, and then you said there's a drop-off. So it's like we've got these separations where the teams at the top are soaring to historic highs in the blue-chip ratio, but at the same time, this cliff has been established, and this cliff is somewhere in the, what, 30s? Where all no, of a sudden, in the 20s. What, so we dropped from like 35 to like 20-something yeah. in terms of uh, having your percentage of four and five stars versus two and three stars – in the list that we said, 16 plus another four that are close, that is 20 of 127 FBS teams that are far and away from a talent perspective, pulling away from everyone else. That is astonishing. It, it, is it astonishing? Like, I, I do wonder, Chip, I, I agree with you. I think it's astonishing to realize, but I wonder if historically that's an anomaly or if that's real or if that's just what the trend has been. Like, we haven't had star ratings for, what, about 90% maybe 80% of the time that college football has been around. It's really only been a thing for about 20 years. We've played college football for you know, about 120 years ish. Uh, so I, I do wonder if like, I guarantee you those teams back in the day clustered talent even more than this to the extent they could identify it. Now you didn't have the internet. You didn't have digital film like we spoke about in the last episode. So if you have some farm boy who never you know, had film on him and never went to your camp, then 
guess what? He was probably going to not, not go to your school. Uh, but I, I think, I do think we've seen a little bit of a trend upwards recently among the super teams. Uh, we used to have a couple more teams that were hanging out in the, the 30% range. And we've seen that, you know, kind of decrease a little bit. The other thing that I will say here, and I need to figure out a way to, to calibrate this, but in 2015 or 2014, the first year where we stopped allowing the crazy over signing, like remember the year that Ole Miss signed like 38 guys mm. and it was kind of like, ah, shit, you ruined it for everybody. Like we, we were always cool with signing a couple, you know, Juco bound guys. And then we're like, wait a second, Ole Miss, you guys signed 38. Now we got to do something about this. Uh, when that stopped happening and you were limited to just basically signing 25, the denominator in the formula went down because you were no longer, you know, it wasn't no longer, no longer like, Hey, 17 out of 31 full no, with full knowledge of, Hey, these guys are signing place. The, the school knows they have no shot to get in. They're not coming here. They're just using an NLI on them previously. Uh, so I do think there's actually an argument for, for raising the floor on this post change of that, but you need to find a way like, but honestly, Clemson winning the title was post change. And so if you raised it, you'd clip them out. So I think keeping it at 50 allows more leeway. It is a criticism I get a lot, though. There's This is too many teams on the list. And my response to that is, I could make this more accurate if I wanted to. I think it would be less intuitive for people out there. Like, I, I see fans on Twitter all the time calculating their blue chip ratio in the middle of, of January, right? Hey, look at our BCR. If you take it more complicated, I think it's less relatable to the average fan. And it doesn't allow for the circumstance where you have a really good roster that's not a crazy elite roster plus a generational quarterback who could take it down. Do How does um, a JT Daniels at Georgia factor in? He was a five-star coming out, transfer in. That just counts as a five-star? No. So I've, I've actually not included transfers in this yet. Um, we really haven't seen the mass explosion of the number of transfers up until this season. I'm going to tinker. I've been kind of playing with a model behind the scenes that includes the transfers. Um, I do think since we are re-rating transfers, we need to use the, the the transfer rating as opposed to the high school rating, just like we would with junior college guys who sign. Uh, I, I do take the updated junior college ranking, obviously, because guys change in JUCO. The one issue that I'm having right now is that these lists of transfers, we are having a hard time figuring out who's a walk-on and who's a scholarship guy. And I know for a fact that some of these schools have told me, yeah, not all our guys are on scholarship. And they're not always willing to say who it is because they don't want to embarrass the kid. Because in many cases, the kid's transferring and he doesn't want to admit that he made a bad choice in transferring. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to go to you know, this school. It's like, oh, cool, good get. And it's like, well, they actually let him come because he's a walk-on, not, not, a, not a scholarship guy. Uh, but I, am gonna, I think I can actually figure out who's who by maybe August. And, and just play around with, with a model that includes transfers on this. Um, well, I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of movement. There's a chance that maybe a team or two could drop out. I don't believe anybody would actually jump in uh, to the list if, if we incorporate the transfers, but it's clearly something that's coming. I mean, we're, we're also dealing with this on the 24-7 side. We're, we're going to be incorporating transfers into our recruiting ranking model um, this fall. How much – bias is there because i'm and i don't want you to be offended by this but no no and i know it works both ways because let's say for instance a player comes out and he's a freshman or sophomore and he starts tweeting out hey i have offers from bama georgia ohio state clemson you guys be like oh well then he must be a five star but i also know it works the same way where if bama or georgia or ohio state or clemson see your rankings they see a five star they say maybe we have to offer them is there any of that going on do you see that happening like do you think the the ratings would change if neither side knew what the other was thinking, like if you didn't put out your ratings until their senior year and the schools didn't, you know, couldn't offer them until their senior year, do you think it would differ much or do you think you would align? Cause I know the guy, I know the work you guys put in. That's why I don't want you to be offended. Cause I know no, I'm not offended at all. I, yeah. So look, I, I'm not afraid to say that, that if, if you don't take into account what the market thinks and the market is the schools offering scholarships, then your rankings will be less accurate. Right. So we absolutely look at who is offering who. This is just, I'll relate this to the betting since I know a lot of our, our fans bet college football. If, and Tom, you'll get this. If you have a model, right? And your model is spitting out wildly different results than the odds, guess what? You're about to take a bath. 
you have got to regress your lines to what the market thinks. You cannot be so cocky as to think that you got everything figured out and ignore all the other important inputs and data that the market will give you. Like I, I routinely, you know, with, with, with my com combined power numbers, I'll, I'll get stuff I'm like, oh, well, I got a nine point edge in that game. You don't have a nine point edge on Vegas in a game. You're, you're crazy. You need to regress that hard to the market. And as the week goes on, you need to regress your power numbers to the market more and more because as more money and more input flows into those Vegas lines, they're going to get more accurate as the week goes on, not less. So the same thing I would relate it to college football and, and, and offering scholarships. Schools absolutely pay attention to what we think of kids. And we've, we've seen, hey, we just put a four-star on this kid, all of a sudden he gets a bunch of offers, right? Because they're thinking, wait a second, you know, maybe Wilt Vaughn or Andrew Ivins has seen this kid in person and felt good enough to throw four stars on him. We also absolutely pay attention to what schools are doing. It's input from the market, educated input from guys that make millions to be right on this kind of stuff. And you have to account for that. I think if you don't, you're foolish. In the changes, because again, you've been doing this a decade. But almost. I will say, I guess, sorry, the last thing on that. We do not react and change somebody's stars based on what offer they get, right? I will say there's been a circumstance where like a couple of big time schools have popped a kid who we have rated like an 83. And that'll be like, wait a second. We don't need to bump this guy, but we do need to make sure that we, we like our 83 on this kid. Why in the world did you know this school, this school, and this school offer? And behind the scenes, you'll ask, right? Hey, what, why did you like this kid? And they'll say, oh, actually, the offers he tweeted out are fake. We, we, we didn't really offer him. Or they'll say, oh, well, we, we had him in our camp recently. Maybe we hadn't seen this kid in person. Maybe it was a film eval. And, uh, you know, he measured you know, six, five and five eights and, and, and ran four, seven. Like, okay. Many, that is useful data. How many kids are tweeting fake offers? A lot. Yeah. Uh, I would think a lot do yeah. too. Yeah. A lot. Or, but it's their, to and their it's, fairness, there might be some soft offers, right. That aren't really real anyway. So it probably goes both ways. There are some high schools. I'm not going to call them out here who, that we know that their kids tweet fake offers to get noticed and the coaches tell them to do it. Like big high schools that are like consistently yeah. turning out. Wow. That's yeah. a, that's a heck of an approach. Uh, you do this every year and you've, you know, you mentioned some of the uh, historical sides, like, you know, in 2014, no one was above 75%. Uh, you know, as you said, we've seen the super teams really get even better. What about some of the changes from like 2020 to 2021 or 2019 to 2020 to 2021? What has been some of the movement within uh, the blue chip ratio as you've seen some programs move up and slide down? Uh, so Texas A&M jumped from, I believe, 50 to 61%. So they, they were the largest riser uh, in large part to number one, they've been recruiting well. Number two, they had the 2017 class fall off the data sheet. Right. And, that and Jimbo's that, early signing, Jimbo's first year? No, that was someone's last last class. Got it. So AM used to be a member of this club pretty routinely because someone recruited pretty well. They used to be like a 55 for center. Uh, and then at the very end of, of, of someone's time, he didn't, you know, like he didn't he didn't sign a very good last class that he was responsible for. Jimbo's first class was okay, not great, but now they're getting that rotated off and, and they're in the state of Texas and he's a really good recruiter. So they're 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 back on the list. I, I think to stay. Uh, Oregon jumped up, by the way. Uh, we, we told their fans last year they probably would be. They were extremely pissed that they were not in last year and Washington was. And, I mean, that thing did, I think, a couple million page views. And uh, I was just – I was loving it because all these Oregon and Washington fans are just arguing their butts off in the comment section at, at each other. And, you know, you suck. This is the last year you guys are going to be on here. And then we'll, we'll be on there soon. And uh, and then there was the Oregon fans who kept telling me how stupid this was. I'm like. Guys, I know it's not perfect. It's just an easy thing to, to latch on to that is consistently, you know, hitting. So, like, yeah, I'm not, not going to not going to change what's what's working. Um, so they're new, and then uh, Miami is is also back. I think last year Miami, uh, oh, their fans were mad because they were 49.3 percent. So my spreadsheet rounded them down uh, <laughs> last year, and of course, since I'm an old, they were alleging bias or conspiracy. But now they're in and they love it. Um, th those are the main changes I would say for this year. The other one I would point out, guys, is, and I, I've mentioned this before on the show, I think, and we talked about this a lot back on Barton and Bud, but Clemson being a tier down is technically accurate, but I do think that Clemson does this almost intentionally. Like, there are guys that teams above them sign who Clemson would not take, mm -hmm. right? Just character, chemistry, whatever. Uh, 
if Clemson wanted to, it absolutely could get into that top tier, I believe. I think the fact that Clemson beats out teams from the top tier for positions and players at once yeah, is the, like, then Clemson fans shouldn't be upset about this. And, uh, and I don't, I, I don't judge just because I mentioned them as a tear down. That's, uh, it, it does not change my expectations for Clemson. Uh, wanted to ask you about Notre Dame because that feels anecdotally, and I don't have the full history pulled up of the blue chip ratio, but seeing how Brian Kelly has been able to not only improve just sort of the overall program health o- over the college football playoff era, but some of that even comes from the recruiting trail. It's a get old and stay old program right now. That's done a really good job of strength and conditioning and player development, but aren't they m- a more recent addition to the blue chip ratio club? They, I think they've actually been in it pretty much every year. Let me, let me look at this. Um, I will say going back to the last point about Clemson, <clears throat> I do wonder like part of what Clemson does and how they recruit, if that would change, if the rest of the ACC actually forced them to change because they caught up, like we see, like you mentioned, like Florida state's coming back. North Carolina is a couple classes away from getting back on there. Like, I think that if we see more ACC teams start pushing Clemson as far as winning the conference, then maybe Clemson doesn't get a little, you know, a little less strict on who they're recruiting. That, that could certainly be. Yeah. Um, all right, so Chip, N- N- Notre Dame has actually been in there. Um, Every year since 2014. Well, heck yeah. So. That's the college football playoff era. Yeah. Right there. yeah. You know, they've, they've had it uh, all the way through the, um, the, the let's, let's go through on blue chip ratio and let's start, let's start striking them off. Okay. Who's, who are you throwing out? We've said, these are the 16 teams that have the talent to win the national championship. When you start looking up and down the list, who, who's some of the first ones that you throw out? Auburn, Texas. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was going to go from the top down. But, yeah, if you come in from the back. Let's go top down. I actually like that better. Yeah, I like yeah. top down. And Texas? LSU? LSU? I don't think you can strike LSU. Like, I, I could really? see LSU going <laughs> – I, I could see them going going five and seven, but I could also see everything clicking and, and them going, you know, 15 and 0. Wow. So, Clip you would that strike – one off. You would strike Texas but not strike LSU. Correct. I mean, LSU I would strike them did both. just win a title two seasons ago. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and, and was, sort of that out was of nowhere. the magic of Burrow and Brady, who are both gone. Like, there's was so it? much turnover from that roster to this one, coaching staff and players on the field. That I don't think it's legitimate. They have stacked talent though in a way that Les Miles did not, except for like maybe like the first Miles class. Um, I, I think there's too much talent there to to legitimately strike them. Like, what I bet on them. Not really, you know, like I, I, I don't mind Oklahoma at some of those early odds. I think some people got what 20 to one Tom, yeah. um, like early on, that's not terrible. You know, Georgia, I've already said, I, I like nine to one. There's some offshores that have 10 to one. If you want to get risky with who might pay you, who might not pay you. Um, but I, I can't, I can't really strike LSU. Can you strike Florida? No. If, if Emory Jones ends up ends up being a stud, I think your defense is improved. And you think you have to take into consideration that Emory Jones can click and be the best visualization of what Dan Mullen plus someone with Emory Jones' skill set can be. Yeah, I mean that, that that's I think this is part of the fun of the metric, right? This is this kind of sets the table. This allows you to strike teams you know, like back in the day. Wisconsin and Michigan State and TCU and Baylor fans hated this thing. We don't really hear about those type teams anymore winning the title. That's probably a result of the playoff era. Huh. (laughs) That's crazy how, like, the four-team playoff eliminated some teams like that from being able to win the title, so we need to increase it to 12. (laughs) Right, we, we we need to give them that false hope. But that's still, good. They, so they we still can go down this shit. list and we can expand it. That's good. So we don't look at them and say no chance to make it. Now well, we can actually make just, it. Just put more frosting on the cake. That's all. <laughs> Doesn't matter mm-hmm. if the cake tastes like shit. Texas Texas A and M, with no certainty at quarterback and no offensive explosiveness that has been shown. Is the talent too much to strike them from the list? See, I feel better about A and M than I do about LSU. I do too. But you don't, do you even know who AM's quarterback is yet? No, but I feel better about no, it. Do you know who LSU's quarterback is definitely <laughs> right. going to be? <laughs> I yeah, think but to I'm strike saying- a team, you have to be, basically say, what is their best case scenario? And is that good enough to win it? 
To I, me, I, LSU and AM both fit as a non strike. As a non strike, they've got to stay in. Yeah, I, I'm leaving them both on my list too. It's just, it's like, let's be real. The reason we feel the way we feel about LSU compared to the way we feel about Texas A&M is Texas A&M finished fifth last year and A&M, or LSU had a bad season. So it's like, and it's probably the right way to feel. I'm just saying, I don't think there's that much of a difference as far as chance of winning the national title this year than between A&M and LSU. I think I need to stop. I, I think I need to remember that Jimbo Fisher did win a national championship. And Odron did too, but mm-hmm. yeah. Texas A&M can't strike. Michigan, easy strike. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Sad. unless unless McCarthy turns out to be a terrific quarterback right from the jump and elevates that team, I have a really hard time seeing Michigan getting out of the Big Ten, let alone to the college football playoff. A little insider so with- note here on Michigan. Uh, and I, I just recorded the Around the Clock UCLA yesterday. We'll probably drop that sometime next week. So Jay Toya... The, the USC transfer who apparently thought he couldn't go to UCLA. That's why he picked Michigan. And now he's going back to UCLA when he realized there wasn't a rule against that. Probably mm-hmm. he was going to start for Michigan's defense at defensive tackle. And he's out and he's gone. Mm. I think that was concerning both ways, but now that he's gone, I have real concerns about their defensive front. I don't think they have the difference makers up front to win a natty. So I, for that reason, I have to strike them. Don't you, I think it's interesting because we've seen, three teams and you could go down the list and go more that we're all probably in agreement because we can't see it. But like, yeah, if, uh, if a Joe Burrow type situation unfolds where all of a sudden you have this massive leap in play or some new starter gets an opportunity and he's a game changer at the most important position of the game, then yes, you could picture them. Like if miles Brennan or Max Johnson, are even remotely close to Joe Burrow, then yeah, I would go ahead and go ahead and say, yeah, they've got a chance. But I think it's very intriguing. And I think that kind of speaks to this blue chip ratio on some teams. You could find a quarterback like that and it still would get them to maybe nine and three, 10 and two. But with these teams on the top end of this list and maybe throughout, if you have a quarterback like that, it could be an undefeated run. Exactly. The other thing with, 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 uh, I did Ed Fang's podcast yesterday, and we were talking about not overweighting last year's results in, in our perceptions of teams this year. I think that's important to remember. I, somebody told me that LSU only traveled 43 scholarship guys to the swamp when they beat Florida. Last year was a really weird year. Now, I know like, like you don't travel all 85 typically, but like you're definitely not traveling just 43. D- Danny, how many, how many did you guys travel in college? Gosh, like 60 I, don't something? Remember. I didn't pay attention. All I knew was I was going. <laughs> I never counted it's, the tickets. It's at least like a two deep in the specialist yes, plus a couple yes, of thirds. Correct. Traders. Yeah. Yeah. So it was we probably had, close uh, to like 60 or 65, yeah, not yeah. 43. No, no. Yeah. We had, we had, and I bet, I bet even then we probably brought close to 70. Like I think we were more liberal with bringing guys. It wasn't a big deal. We just brought as many as we could. Especially if it was a bus trip, you know, with, yeah. with the flights that, that, that costs a little more. NFL is 53, right? So they were traveling yes. with less than. Yeah. NFL yeah, roster. It, yeah. Goodness gracious. Um, um, all right. So we strike Auburn, in Auburn, Auburn, Oregon, and Penn state are all grouped up at 56. I'll strike Auburn. And I think that might be it. I would strike Penn state. Yeah. I was going to say, why aren't we striking Penn State? <laughs> yeah. I think Penn State was on was on an upward trajectory before last year. I think they have quite a bit of talent, a lot of athleticism on defense. I, I could – if – I don't think Ooh. this will happen. I don't think this will happen. I don't think this will happen. If Sean Clifford turns into Joe Burrow or some semblance of, you know, you, you could see it. Yeah. I, and- I think that, like, right now – if you're asking me to handicap like the big 10 teams that aren't Ohio state's ability to win a national title, I would have Penn state ahead of Michigan, but I yeah. still don't see it happening for either of them. Penn state thinks they got the best group of pass catchers since like 2018. I hope they do. They I, think we, that this is, they think this thing's ready to go. I'd, I'd really like the big Penn 10 East to be a lot more interesting. I hope they do. <laughs> okay. Uh, Notre Dame and Miami. I I'm will st- not strike Miami. I'm striking Miami. Derrick uh, King is a difference maker. Yeah, but is he 100? percent I it just it's more of a presence than you've got for some of these other teams where we've got quarterback questions. Like there's Stop. more proven there. I, 
I'm kind of confident in Notre Dame's QB situation. I know it's not Ian Book anymore, and it's going to be, but I, I kind of have a certain level of trust in what they'll have there combined with the rest of the talent that they have on that roster. So, and I do think that, you know, going back to the independent life kind of gives them another avenue to get to the playoff. This is a team that's been to the playoff a few times already. So I, I'm not going to strike them. In some ways, the uncertainty of the new QB makes me not like, makes me want to not strike them. If it was still Ian book, might be I would probably strike it. Yes. The the other thing is I I'm trying to let me pull it up here. So last year, this was something that that I, I had in my notes from from handicapping them last year. So Braden Lindsay and Kevin Austin Jr., who Kevin Austin's from my North Broward prep down by Danny. Uh they only played so Kevin Austin caught or had three passes thrown thrown to him. He caught one of them. Mm-hmm. Braden Lindsay only caught seven passes. So there are two guys who all their Notre Dame insiders were telling us in the preseason were going to be the dudes. It wasn't Javon McKinley in the preseason. It was Braden Lindsay and Kevin Austin. And both those guys got hurt immediately. And I think it really kneecapped that offense because they couldn't get the ball downfield. And when the teams beat them, they played solos on the outside. Notre Dame really couldn't do anything about it. Those guys are both back and healthy. So I can't strike Notre Dame. Yeah, and go back to like the QB situation. And we, we talked about how well Ian Book played last year. But I don't think Ian Book has it in his arsenal to take advantage of those weapons at receiver. Like, I think a lot of the reasons that we saw Notre Dame's tight ends having so much success with, like, those routes up the seams and over the middle is because that's where Ian Book is more comfortable throwing the ball. Like, the kind of vertical routes down the sidelines, I I think the part of it the last few years is Notre Dame hasn't had those weapons because, like, the guys you mentioned were hurt. But I also don't think they had the quarterback to take advantage of when they were healthy. So I think that we could potentially see an upgrade at that position for the Irish. Maybe not in leadership, but in arm talent. USC. Oh, you guys are right. You guys are already fire Clay Helton, so they're definitely okay. struck from, struck from this have, list. Have they fired Helton yet? No. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not they're... striking them. <laughs> no, they've got they've got a quarterback that can win a national championship if he plays to his potential. They can get to the playoff. You don't think that they could go toe to toe with and win no. two playoff games? No. God no. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. If they if they're a hundred percent healthy and they don't like injury luck gives them the best because to me I think that the top end of USC's roster if there's if like if you turn uh, fatigue off on the sliders and if you turn <laughs> injuries off on the sliders that video game USC team can win two games in the college football playoff. Let's let's look at our foremost active playoff teams. We've got Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, Oklahoma. Which two of those are USC beating? I mean, you'd have to have a massive, down, like five interception performance from the opposing quarterback, exactly, in order for it to happen. Hey, Hugh Freeze beat Nick Saban two years in a row. Okay, yeah, Anything. but he didn't beat him two games in a row. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not striking USC. But are you striking USC? No, I, I, I can't because I, I know the level of athleticism that's on that team. I, I, I've seen it up close. Like, I, I, my head says yes, but my memory says no. So, I, I, for that, I, I am on the right side of history again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, I'm, I'm going to join Tom on this. Thank I'm, you. I'm, Thank okay, you, bud. Because I, I think they have some holes on defense. And, uh, look, I'm not saying Clay Helton's a terrible coach, but I don't really trust him to win a national title. USC's number is like right around Auburn. It would be a Auburn like team, right? Where you would be looking at, uh, you, you'd be like, they've got an elite, like one of the best pass rushers in the country who probably is so dominant that he makes everybody else on the defensive line better. You know, you've got uh, overwhelming wide receiver talent. That's not like Auburn, but you know, the running game's kind of okay. The offensive line probably isn't in a position where you would say that is national championship quality, but there's enough individual performers that I think that you could have some, some real superhero type stuff. By the way, a future show we should do this off season or next, which, uh, which coaches careers or legacies or, you know, how we view them would be most changed. If you could remove one player that they've had. Remove. Remove. 
Like if they didn't have this one guy, which coaches would we think the most different about? Where's where's Clemson if they never got to Sean Watson? Yeah. They did have Taj. They were already recruiting uh yeah. Trevor. But, I mean, I think Mac the Brown? Success- Vince. Ooh. The guy that could never get over the hump. Yeah, take away Vince. I mean, like they never even came close to another title. Well, I guess no. I mean, Obama thumped it, but they did get there. What about Vince Dooley if he loses Herschel? That's probably a good one. We should save this for, for a full episode. This is okay. really fun. We're doing like the butterfly effect where Derek Dooley never ends up at Tech, Tennessee. And I'm trying to figure No, I was thinking about Jimbo some without Janus, Mal, or uh, Mal, Malzon and Chiswick without, uh, without Cam. Damn. I was going to yeah, say Chiswick's, Chiswick's fate without Cam probably isn't any different than his fate with Cam. All right, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Once again, uh, the blue chip ratio, the 16 teams that have the necessary talent required to win a national championship is Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, Clemson, LSU, Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, Texas A&M, Michigan, Auburn, Oregon, Penn State, Notre Dame, Miami, and USC. If your favorite team isn't on that list, Pack it up, okay? You don't even need to watch a thing. Just listen to the Cover 3 podcast and follow our locks, and you'll totally enjoy uh, the college football season. Obviously, I kid, I kid. Coming up on the other side, we're getting more details from behind the scenes of the future of the college football playoff, and it's going to have some very interesting impacts on the way that we talk about it, the way the sport is presented, and the way that some conferences are organized. Getting into all that and much more next It's interesting that so much of our conversation around the playoff was talking about the health of the sport, how many people are interested, and whether or not this would be good to well, some people care about the health fans. of fans on this show, <laughs> <laughs> but whether or not it would be good for fans to be deluded because fan delusions are great and they keep them downloading the Cover Three podcast. And I mean, it kind of. It kind of seems like that is a that is a concern that is not just held here on the Cover Three podcast, huh? Yeah, I, I was reading Nicole, uh, Nicole Auerbach's article at the Athletic, and she spoke to Lee Fitting, who's like the producer of Game Day, right, and, and r- kind of runs their college football stuff over there. And uh, I thought it was extremely interesting because she spoke with him before all the twelve team stuff came out. I believe uh, is, what, is what, what she said. I, I asked her yesterday. Uh, some of these comments kind of reflect that ESPN is starting to realize that banging the playoff at every single commercial break and every time you cut back to the studio and filling game day with nonstop 14 playoff talk is kind of undercutting uh, their own product. It's own inventory. <laughs> yeah. wow. what, what quote do you want to go with, Chip? There, there's so many. Let's see. Uh, here we go. How about? It's time to take a little reset as far as we're concerned. And this is all from The Athletic. Said Lee Fitting, ESPN Senior Vice President of Production Overseeing College Football. Also, as Bud mentioned, he's the the game day guru. Uh, Obviously, the playoff needs to remain a priority, A, for the sport, and B, for business. But at the same time, I'm worried that we've gone a little too far away from what makes college football great. And that is there is something in every game for fans out there. It's not just the top four, five, six, or seven teams who are playing for something it is my belief that the college football fan is different than most other sports fans and that they still want to hear about their team, regardless of where they fall in the national picture. I will also echo that my experience being a fan of college football and watching college game day was to get a taste of what was going on around the entire country. Like that's why I I woke up. That's why I was excited about it. That's why before we went down to the stadium for our noon kickoff, shout out to the John Bunning years, noon kickoffs. Let's go. Uh, you know, we were always wanting to see what was going on elsewhere. So the, the fact that they've understood some of the, um, you know, un- understood the way that game day and the college football presentation has shifted is definitely significant. Uh, also this from Reese Davis game day has a big umbrella over the sp- game day has as big an umbrella of the sport as humanly possible. But if you try to do all that and ignore the monster, that is the playoff, you are not servicing the largest number of your viewers because for better or worse at this moment in the sport, Everything is viewed to a degree through the lens of how it impacts the playoff picture. I don't think we have to be exclusively in that vein, but we have to expect it. Interesting to hear Reese's side, which is almost you know opposite of some of the, the Lee fitting quotes. I don't, um, 
I don't want to make this all like a cover three podcast breaks down college football, college game day, but with ESPN being the rights holder for the college football playoff, it's where we tune in on Tuesday nights to find out the rankings release. I, I think that they are, um, they, they cannot be uh, hands off in terms of the way we discuss this format for the postseason in the sport. The network that made rankings a television show now thinks we're spending too much time focusing on the playoff. And also, like, <clears throat> I'm happy to see, like, Fitting thinks that or is at least kind of coming to that conclusion. But I'm still worried by that, that quote that you read, Reese. Is obviously the playoff needs to remain a priority, A, for the sport, and B, for business. Why does it need to remain a priority for the sport? This is what is never explained. It's business. That's why it needs to remain a priority for business, because we've bought it. We spent a lot of money on it, and we need to make sure that it is the most important thing. So that way we get the ratings when the games are played. So that way we could sell the advertisers what we told them we were selling them. And so, Reese, I love you, but you're not servicing your viewers if you're not talking about the playoff, because that's what they're tuning in for. No, that's kind of a chicken and egg thing. They're tuning in, and all you're talking about is the playoff. I don't know. I, I, haven't been on both sides of this, right? And I've I can almost recall in fitting in Herb Street are very tight. And Herb Street holds a lot of power at ESPN, like even more so than a lot of executives. His voice carries a lot of weight. And I feel like I remember, I can't recall the segment exactly on game day when even Herb Street has voiced some of the frustration. Maybe it was last year or the year before, about there are some great games that are taking place today, like pleading the audience saying, just because they're not in the playoff race. And I've maybe in the conversation of opting out or play or meaningless games, meaningless bowl games, and him saying these aren't meaningless because these players love the sport. So I think there's a tug there that comes about Tom. I disagree with you. I don't think it's about the, I don't think it's all about the money. Clearly a large part of it is about the money, but I do think that what we've done is we've found a better way to determine a, a national champion to crown a national champion. Cause I don't think any way you would argue me would convince me that having only two teams would be the best way to do it. But I do think what happened is I do think who ESPN, the playoff combined, I think they might've misplayed how many teams would be a part of the playoff conversation. And that because we've seen in the last seven years, which is kind of crazy, all of a sudden, these three to four to five programs really dominate. That has excluded a large part of the college football landscape so that whether they acknowledge it or not, you can say they still love going to the games and they love pageantry and they love rivalries. They don't feel like they're a part of the biggest thing in college football. And I think that no, and, and maybe it was impossible to predict that these teams could have this stranglehold on those top four or five spots. But I think this is probably a reaction to that, See, getting the same four teams almost every time. And then, and that's where I think the advantage of expansion comes in because this will just by default, because the numbers involved will increase that percentage. And you know, we had some fun on that exchange in those yesterday too, because the NFL they don't talk primarily. Imagine if they just talked about the Super Bowl. And I get it's a part of the conversation, but a lot of the NFL discussions are around who's going to make the playoffs. And that gives a lot of teams hope later in the season. I mean, you're at more than half the teams uh, late in the season in December feel like they have a chance just to get in. And so that keeps them invested. And you didn't have that. You really have never had that in college football. And now we're getting closer to that. And I don't want it to be half the teams in college football, but it'll be a significant portion where a lot of teams will feel like they have a chance. Yeah, and the reason they spend so much time talking about the playoffs in the NFL is because regular season really doesn't matter as much seeing as how nine and seven teams can make the playoffs. Why do they still rate so well? Why is there so much fan interest? Because it's the NFL. It's, right. But well, don't I mean, you think that reigns the same for college football? It's college football. Like the fans will still watch. Yes. Fancy upside in their teams. This is what I was talking about. Like even if we know – that, that this Cinderella team doesn't have a chance in hell. If they've ridden with that team the entire year, they see they're still alive for a playoff berth, they're tuning in. They're believing they're watching. I, I have a question for you guys. So we, we have all these quotes, and I, I think you should go read Nicole's story and, and support good journalism. There's no way in hell Lee Fitting says this stuff if she interviews it. Like, she talked to him before the, all, all the 12-team playoff stuff came out. He doesn't say this stuff, right? Like, there's no way he'd give these quotes because – this is great for ESPN now. They can continue their focus on the playoff because focusing on the playoff now is not 
hey, we're going to talk six teams and four will make it. It's we're going to talk about 20 to 25 teams, even by mid-November, and another 10 to 12 teams who might play spoiler for those. And at that point, guys, we're up to about 30% of the sport. I really don't believe you need to talk about 100% of the sport or even 50% of the teams, but you can't get away with talking 5% of the teams, right? And that's, in Mm -hmm. some cases, what they were doing. So, like, ESPN got a tremendous bailout for this. They have beat this playoff drum way too hard in the current format and made people feel, you know, kind of marginalized about the fandom of their own team. But now, like, if if I can shoehorn talk about 35 teams into the college football game day, that's plenty. I don't need to hear about, you know, Maryland-Purdue. That's not a game. That's not a game I really gave a damn about earlier. Like those teams ain't making the playoff in any format, probably. But now, like I can make a, a we can do a five minute game day segment on I don't know, like Ar- Arkansas and Texas A and M. Can Arkansas play spoiler? Can Texas A and M keep their dream alive? They've been hot lately. If they make the playoff, they're a dangerous team. That, that's a good discussion we should have too. By the way, for a future show, who are the teams that maybe stumble early, got hot late, and would have been you know, really tough outs in the playoff. That's a cool thing that they'll be able to talk about now with, with this new playoff. I just don't think fitting would have said any of this if, if, uh, if the timing of this was different. So some advice for ESPN, just from somebody who watches all your games, like on Saturday night, when it's Kirk and Chris doing the big game of the week and you've got your bigger national audience, you want to spend some time talking about the playoff and doing the promo fine, because a lot of, you know, general fans are tuning in for those games, whether they care about the teams or not. But if I'm watching Toledo and Miami of Ohio on Tuesday, you do not need to talk about the college football playoff for half the freaking game because I don't care. I'm only there to watch those teams. The people watching those games are either there because they've got a bet on the game or they actually care about those two teams. You do not need to inundate them. Now, do it a little bit because obviously your network, you got to promote your other stuff. You got to get them to watch your other things. But you don't need to spend the entire damn third quarter with the two announcers talking about playoff scenarios while the game goes on in the and background. they do it. And they do it every week. Like to be <laughs> fair, the Mountain West game was the really bad one. Like, like I forgot what game was last year, but they did spend. Danny's like about to say we do it minutes. too. No, 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 no. I was gonna say to be fair, as somebody who's called some of those games, like you might want to actually talk about the playoff in that scenario because it's more entertaining than the crappy game that you're calling. So just think about the announcers too. That sometimes just find find the entertainment in the terribleness i mean that's what (laughs) maction is just bathe in it just wash yourself in this mediocre football that everybody loves (laughs) when we talk about the conversation in november and whether like how many teams are going to be involved the numbers game was something that jerry palm pointed out he was on the radio in north carolina he says if we are sitting there on november 7th and two teams are a lock then we're only talking about two spots So it's a small group for who can be in those two spots. We are going to have the exact same scenario where we're going to come down and we're going to say, all right, these three teams are a lock, but because there's so many more bids up for grabs, including the automatics and the conference championship, then that makes the the conversation bigger too. Like I, I just was thinking about like, not just checking out because your team is lost early, like uh, your team has stumbled a little bit. Now you're hot, but just, in terms of just an overall, how wide can you cast a net? It's only going to be as wide as the spots that are available. And in every single college football season, at that point in the calendar, we can probably say, oh, yeah, these two teams, yeah, they're in no matter what. And Jerry Palm always makes people so mad when he's like, Alabama could lose the rest of its games and it will make the college football playoff. He's really good at being like definitive about it. He's like, there is nothing that anyone can do to have better wins than what Alabama has at this point. And I feel like that's a, that's a way that they've just been able to stumble into this. And, and like we said, keep so much of the country interested. There's still going to be two teams that are locks mm-hmm. every single there's year. Gonna be, there's going to be four or five teams. that are. Locks yeah. There might be, somebody. there will be more locks because yeah. they'll have that. Their resumes so? will be, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, um, they, but they're, they're going to have to keep playing hard to get that by though. Right. Like yeah. that is the important thing that, I know we kind of joked around, like, are, are they going to rest their players? If you run the math on it, the buy is a, even though Alabama may be 80% to beat the 12 seed, if, if they were, if we were in a non buy format, like the buy is a really big advantage to, to your national title odds. Like they mm-hmm. will keep playing hard for that. I, I, I throw out those arguments, not that we made them, but like some people are like, Oh, they'll sit their guys. I mean, no, they won't. Um, one other uh, quick note before we get out of here. 
um, if division play goes away, what are some of the, the first things that come to mind in terms of the impacts for y'all? What that'd be like kind of a turnaround for a program like Wisconsin, where like when the thing expands, you're like, hey, we're going to actually have a chance to get to the playoff now. And it's like, yeah, but we're going to take away divisions. Then it's like, oh. <laughs> so the optics of this, you'll have probably multiple teams that lose their conference championship that'll still get in the playoffs. So I worry about the diminishing of impact it could have on conference championship games. I think the, the, the key though, is they, they found a, a creative way to emphasize the conference championship games with the buy. Cause you, know, you cannot get a buy unless you win your conference title. I so think like, it totally can hurt. Something to me that tells me, and again, if it, and again, it happened last year and it wasn't the end of the world, but something like in sports, when you get to the postseason, which is after the regular season and you lose, it's okay for it to be final and that's it. So, and I, maybe that's just a, I have to come to grips with that because the, it's not the technically it's the playoff, it's the championship game. And we see it happen in basketball all the, all, all the time. I just don't love the optics of it. Maybe it's something personal with me that I have to get past. I think it totally changes the way we talk about some jobs and programs because oftentimes on this podcast, whether we're talking about how good a job is or how likely they are to be able to win a conference championship or make a run at a college football playoff, we always talk about like the path, the path, the path, and you know, ACC, Coastal, Big Ten, West, Pac-12, South. You know that that changes. Like all of a sudden, whatever advantage that you have for thinking that a job is better in the Big Ten West than it is in the Big Ten East because of how easy it is to be able to at least make it to the Big Ten title game. Hey, all you got to do is just play better than Ohio State one time. Like all that goes out the window. I think it really levels out some of the imbalance in terms of just how we talk about a lot of jobs and programs. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I've, I've been one of the many, like, was it Connolly who started doing the pod system? The pods. First? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been on board with it since he first like getting rid of the divisions, especially because at the time was when the big Ten was calling it the freaking legends and leaders, which was just embarrassing, but <laughs> like, <clears throat> The divisional aspect made sense at the time, but they have kind of outgrown the necessity to have it, the need to have it, and just the utility of how it works and that it does kind of hurt a lot of conferences and that they have their best teams in the same division and it will impact their ability to get to the playoffs. So I do think that we're probably going to see it. And I think that just for a fan perspective, as far as the regular season, because like when you look at the way the division setup is with scheduling, like with only like, like the SEC playing an eight-game conference schedule, where Alabama and Georgia are meeting once every six seven years in the regular season like it's hard to say we're in the same conference when we never play each other and I think that if you get rid of that and it just gives greater rotation to teams being able to see other schools and all that kind of stuff I think that's healthy for the conferences the SEC should strike now by the way while Auburn and Georgia are or excuse me Auburn and Tennessee are down because I'm pretty sure weren't those the two schools that would have the most gripes because they think they have all these rivalries that other teams mm -hmm. don't really consider rivalries with them uh, like now that they're losing, they have a little bit less, you know, power and cachet. If, if the SEC did this, it would be, I think it'd be awesome. You'd have what three protected rivalries every year, and then everybody else rotates. So you're playing these other teams much more frequently. Like, does Alabama still look at Tennessee as a rival? I mean, they still, they still fire light up, up the cigars. cigars. Yeah, but I'm saying, is that a rival or is that just, oh, that's the game where we smoke cigars afterwards? That's what it's become. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's become the, the one where we smoke cigars and get a bunch of likes on Instagram, post it in black and white, get a photo with Saban for the uh, the extra engagement. I see I see Alabama fans online arguing with a lot of other fans of other teams. I never really see Alabama fans talking crap about Tennessee. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like that's kind of, they're just kind of moving past that. Yeah, they it's are. Cool. Uh, I mean, they just they, in the Twitter era, Tennessee just had a lot to talk about. <laughs> Uh, all right. He is Bud Elliott. You can follow him on Twitter at Bud Elliott three. You can follow him at Danny Cano. You can follow him at Tom Fernelli. You can follow me at chip underscore Patterson. We will be back with a mail bag to get your weekend started. Right. Gentlemen. Thank you very much. 